Wait. Please tell me that one. Yes. And there you have it. So wait. All right, we got folks joining. Welcome, everybody. We will get started here momentarily. Give everybody time to trickle in. Trickle in. This is not trickle down economics, though. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We will get started momentarily. Hey, John. Good to see you join. John Chiodo. I was going to say, hey. Chiodo. There he is. John, how you doing? It's been too long. We'll just give it one more minute. We still have folks joining. Sure. I'm going to run out of coffee. I'm just telling everyone right now. Be prepared. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's my eighth cup, so I think I'm okay. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> that explains well, I've seen, so much. I've seen you drink coffee in the late afternoon, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was your eighth cup of coffee. It's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we go ahead and get this show on the road. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to Dreaming of AI, Perspectives on AI Use and Cultural Heritage. My name is Alex Cron, and I am BPOC's Digital Operations and Collections Information Analyst. Here with me today, I have BPOC CEO, Nick Honeyset, Strategist and Innovation Specialist, Jack Ludden and Harvard Art Museum's Director of Digital Infrastructure and Emerging Technology, Jeff Stewart. You can read more about Jeff uh, in the speaker bios and Nick, Jack and I on and BPOC on the BPOC website. For those who are joining us for the first time, BPOC is a nonprofit digital strategy and technology consultancy based in San Diego, California. We have been hosting free technology webinars since late 2020 to facilitate discussions around the technologies we use in museums, libraries, archives, and galleries. You can check out recordings of our past webinars on our website and our YouTube channel. I am going to keep this short so we can dive right into what we're all really here for. But before we do get started, there's just a few items that I want to mention. As you know, we will be inviting attendees to join us in the discussion today. We will facilitate this by asking that you put comments and questions in the Q&A section, and we will invite folks to join us on camera to speak. Um, and we will do that in, or, in the order that we receive those questions and comments. You will have a few minutes to discuss your experiences with AI or ask a question that you have for the speakers. Um, since we only have an hour, we will keep each discussion opportunity around five minutes or less. Uh, attendees are more than welcome to contribute to the discussion in the chat as well. We have Zoom transcription and the Otter, Otter, sorry, Otter AI transcription service in the upper left-hand corner if you need transcription assistance. Most importantly, we realize that the topic of AI is controversial, controversial so that we ask that everyone keeps the discussion respectful and friendly. Um, Last and certainly not least, we are conducting a survey on current AI usage. Um, I will share the survey link in the chat and again when we promote the webinar recording. The survey results and what is discussed during the webinar today will be anonymized and summarized in a report published to the public on BPOC's website and social media channels. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nick to share a few items that he'd like to cover and then it's over to Jeff to get our conversation started. Wait, what? And I've only had one coffee. Um, no, I just want to like to welcome everyone. Um, this is a topic that we've certainly been um, 
uh, working on with museums over the last kind of, I guess, six to nine months really is when it's it's kind of really come to the forefront. I think I think we characterized it as we're all joining Jeff's party because Jeff's been doing, uh, I'm working in this space for a long time. And, I, and I'll just say this, this is a filled with opportunity and challenge, right? And I think there's as many challenges and issues as there are opportunities. And I'll just share one, uh, one of the early interactions I had, which kind of sets the scene about how important this is to the museum field. So uh, we're in the middle between the kind of vendor community and, and the museum community. And about four or five months ago, I had a lunch uh, with an entrepreneur who wanted to know whether he could do the following which was he wanted to create an app that could interpret any collection object in any museum in any country um, in the world and in any language. And he wanted to know what was what could stop him doing that. And, and apart from the, um, the wild and allergic reaction from the, muni the museum community, there's nothing to stop him. I mean, no authority checks, you know, he he had a, a kind of a get out clause for everything I threw at him. So I think that's that's the problem, right? The, the problem is the there is a danger that we as a community lose the authority of interpretation of our collections for, for one thing. And, and we need to figure out what are we going to do about it? That's all I have to say. I think the other thing is this: we're just going to scratch the web and uh, scratch the surface of this. So this webinar is just the first in a bunch of conversations. And I think, as we did for dams and collections management, we're trying to assess what is most important to the community, and then we'll kind of iterate down on on those topics in the coming months. And and with that, I think uh, we're handing over to Jeff. Is that right, yeah, Alex? Jeff, all yours. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's super exciting to see so many people here on this call today. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you all see that. Do you indeed see the yes, hardware music? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, very good. I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, so here it goes. Hi. I'm Jeff Stewart, and I like flights of fancy. So let's take a brief trip together. But before we take off, I have four facts to share about Harvard Art Museums. Number one, about 10 years or 10 or so years ago, we started testing commercial computer vision services on our collections images. Fact two, about seven years ago, we started to employ five different commercial CV services in our production data pipeline. Fact three, as of today, we have roughly 47 million machine-generated descriptions and tags covering roughly 317,000 images of artwork, um, all at your disposal. Fact four, um, that's all the facts for now. So it's time to buckle up and take off. Okay, I have two fantastical, but I assure you, true stories to tell. I promise they are rooted in the topic of intelligence, both artificial and natural. I often like to take a meandering stroll through our collections. And during these moments, I do my absolute best to set my mind free and attempt to look at art anew. So about 12 years ago, while on a stroll, I stumbled upon an elephant in the museum. At the time I was amused about finding an elephant in one of our rooms, but didn't think much else about it. Because I mean, like when it comes to art museums, there are a lot of elephants in the room. So really no surprise there. So I filed this experience away and kept strolling. And as the days and months went on, I took more strolls looking for inspiration in our collections. And on some of these occasions, the elephant popped up. Once again, I was amused for a moment then carried on my way. Until one day on another stroll, I nearly walked right smack into the elephant. Again, I was amused in part because it seemed to me like the elephant was starting to toy with me. It seemed to be saying, never thought you'd find me here, did you? I became pretty convinced it was trying to lure me into a game of hide and seek. So as you know, someone who likes games and to play and have fun in museums, I thought, you know, game on, let's do this. So we went back and forth for years. Sometimes it would throw me a bone, popping up in all its glory. Other times it would cloak itself, you know, can never... Stop thinking what a clever pachyderm I was engaging with here. Uh, and then it would often really try to hide itself in plain sight, just, just daring me to find it. 
making me pause and wonder if it really is there. And wouldn't you know it, if you take a moment and just ponder this beach scene, there you have it. You have an elephant emerging from the, from the, uh, the, the waters. Occasionally, the same elephant would like to bring along friends. These elephants would jump between artworks with such grace, traversing the art museum so effortlessly. It really, really started to astound me uh, what, this, what this animal was capable of doing. So clever with their hiding spots, always looking for somewhere new to put itself. So playful throughout this game in hide and seek, shockingly playful. So clever with how they're leading me through the collections. And now when I stroll through the collections, I no longer shy away from the elephants in the room. I let, let the elephants be my guide. Part two, story number two. One afternoon, I was chatting with a few AIs and we were looking at this photograph. I turned to clarify and asked at what time of day it thinks the photo was taken. And it was like, I'm 97.2% certain it was taken at dusk. But then it hesitated and said, you know, but I'm also 97% sure it was taken at dawn. I looked nervously over at Google Vision and asked, what do you think? Google was like, it is most definitely red sky at morning. I'm a solid 85.2% confident in my opinion. Hey, Imogen, what do you think? Imogen, never quite confident in itself, blurted out sunset with 48 45.9% confidence in his voice. Then seconds later, followed up meekly with, yeah, but maybe it's sunrise, registering a mere 29.1% in confidence. Clarify piped back up and said with 87.3% finality, regardless, I declare this to be art. Part 2A. In 2017, we started a project called Project Alice. ALICE is an acronym for Advanced Listening Interface for Curious Earthlings. The project centered on a work, on work a colleague and I did with an undergraduate student with low vision. The student wrote a set of guidelines for us, a set of guidelines of best practices for visual descriptions based on her specific needs. We then put the guidelines into practice by writing descriptions of several paintings, then recording ourselves reading them for inclusion in an audio guide. For this project, I wrote a visual description and made a recording for the painting Leander's Tower on the Bosporus. You can visit the object page and find the recording linked near the bottom if you want to listen to it. I described the painting as depicting sunrise on a calm day. I went on to embellish the description about, you know, the, the rowers and the bird and the placement and the structure. Days after I wrote that description, one of our curators listened to the recording of it. They said based on research with other colleagues, they believe the painting depicts sunset. Well, guess what? That bit of information, that little tidbit, that interpretation is nowhere in our catalog. So me being me, I felt suddenly absolved of my ignorance. I felt suddenly free, free to embrace the power of interpretation, free to interpret the scene based on my understanding of the world, free to participate in the messiness of intelligence and experience, and most of all, free to embrace the beautiful subjectivity of art. Thanks for listening. And if you really want to dig into some of this stuff, here are a few pointers to it all. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm happy to share these slides after the fact. Thank you, oh, Jeff. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Jack now. All right. Super quick here. All right, can you see that? Yep. Excellent. All right. First of all, it is great to have everyone here this morning. Um, it's a great conversation and clearly one that's gonna keep going for quite some time. So what is taking space up in my head? First of all, I'm gonna move over my metaphor to a whole truckload of elephants <laughs> because that's exactly what it feels like, right? There are so many things that uh, that sort of that are sort of competing with one another regarding AI and cultural heritage, right? 
the crux of it to the, is this for me, is that there is an anxiety. I think we all feel it. And, and, and the anxiety is shared. Right? You've got people who understand, and I use that in quotes, dramatic, heavy quotes, who understand AI, and there's a level of anxiety and concern about how it gets used, why it gets used, all of that good stuff. And then you also have a whole lot of people who don't know much about it, right? And that's just true all across the board, whether or not we're looking at cultural heritage or just generally broad speaking in society. There's anxiety around that. Okay, so I think we sort of established that. I love this quote. So now it's a perfect opportunity to sort of raise the notion of, right, we cultural heritage, right, museums, historical sites, art museums, all this good stuff, we have this remarkable, trustworthy perspective that's been put upon us uh, you know, in, in our culture, which is fantastic. With all due, I think that raises our anxiety level a bit, right? So how do we match that sort of responsibility with what this tidal wave is bringing, right? That's a big piece. <laughs> that's one of the big pieces that's in, that's in my head. And I have to say, and again, I apologize, this is probably going to feel slightly stressful as well, but I have to, I got to tell you, I've got my high school basketball coach like chirping in my ear. And, and, and he was quoting Vince Lombardi, which I didn't know at the time, which is, if you're five minutes early, you are already 10 minutes late to practice, right? I hate to say it, but it, it depends what kind of person you are, right? Because if fun, creativity, looking for impact, thinking about how you can make things more efficient, by the way, AI can do all those things, from my personal opinion. If those things aren't, don't feel like they sort of motivate or connect, you or us together, then the problem is, is that there's a whole truckload of people who are all and, and, and corporations that are already doing this. And so we're kind of late. And so there's an opportunity for us to really start sort of coalescing together and to find what those, um, uh, to, to find these solutions, to find these kind of wonderful moments that we find the elephants in those paintings and in the works of art, right? And I'm sure we're going to talk about it in a little bit and hear from all of you, right? But there's a, I think it's the fulcrum, right? Let's find the right metaphor. But there are these, there are multiple forces going on. Again, fun, creative, impactful, it can be efficient. But then we clearly need to think about what's the, the biases that are taking place, what, what uh, privacy concerns, authenticity. There are all these things that we need to address as we're trying to figure this out as, uh, as a group. Lo and behold, here's another thing, right? Nick could do this. I'm sure Jeff could do this. Alex could do this, right? I think about, right? I remember showing someone, you know, HyperCard 30 plus years ago, right? I remember talking to colleagues about there's this crazy new device that you can, you know, a mobile device that we can use to, to, to provide interpretation on. I remember talking to colleagues about social media. And typically, broadly speaking, when those topics were addressed, they tended to be technology, digital world. Generally speaking, that's where that was taking place. And then over time, it would broaden to other areas. I think I would make the argument that that's different now, right? We've got all these amazing areas of expertise in cultural heritage, and AI can impact all of them, right? It's not just about the technology, it's ultimate because it's so ubiquitous, it's about how do each of those expertise and those interests, how do they use AI, right? That's a heck of, again, a heck of an opportunity. So it's not just one sort of component of cultural heritage, it's all of us together, right? To even hit that further home, right? Think about all the various touch points and moments that, you're, that, that we have with our, with our visitors, right? Our audiences along their journey with how they interact with cultural heritage, right? Each one of those touch points, again, I'm gonna kind of go on a limb here, probably has or can have some element of AI kind of embedded in it to help it become more fun, more efficient, right? All of that kind of good stuff. So there's definitely ways that we can then think about how can we now take those, those, those moments, those interactions with, with, our, with our visitors, right? And how can we do our works differently or provide an, a unique experience differently with AI? My, and my guess is with all of you, on the, uh, you know, here, you've also realized either you're doing it or you've realized that we can do it. This is a crazy screen. I'm only going to show it for two seconds. And only to say, right, 
there are dozens and dozens of ways to interact across the board, right? That's really what's imagined. So, the, you know, the, the brainstorming that can take place, right? Which, by the way, AI can help with, <laughs> um, allows for this momentum for us to understand how in all those various expertise, how can AI, how can artificial intelligence help us? Last but not least, right? So to, again, so what's going on in my head, I suppose I tried to boil down to the question, right? Right? How do we, and I mean all of us in this industry, in this field, how do we define and build towards best practices, right? Everything is getting better, right? I mean, Jeff, I mean, right? Puppies and muffins, you're finding the elephants. So like it's there. We're, 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 it's getting incredible. It's improving every day, which is amazing. How do we, how can we leverage that broadly? Um, Jeff, you also sort of, it's funny, I, you know, the, you know, the notion of like contradiction, but, but so there's this remarkable technologies that allow us to do these amazing things. There are these incredible like conflicts around ethics and around sort of the quality of the data. But I sort of my, my last comment, and I would love to hear from everyone else is how do we, with that tension, as a community, how do we kind of raise all of ourselves together? Clearly, conversations like this help provide a level of foundation, but we do need, I think, some sort of level of uh, sort of commonality and, um, and and sort of best practices and understanding. So, for better or for worse, that's what's going inside my head, and I'm now going to turn it back over to to Nick or to Alex. Are those yeah. are those free muffins? Those are free. I assume they're free puppies. <laughs> okay, I have, I have one story why people are, uh, and, and please, if, if you have questions, we, we did get a bunch of questions um, when the invitation went out, but I have one dispatch from the trenches, um, a museum, art museum that we're working with, um, uh, are challenged with capacity, right, as, as many institutions are post-pandemic with cuts to, to staffing, and so we had a conversation um, about how with, with the leadership team about how to embed AI to improve uh, productivity capacity. And the chief curator in the room um, ripped me a new one, um, told me how insulted she was that I would suggest that something like AI should be brought into the context, particularly of a, a curatorial uh, department. Um, I took it on the chin and then I said to her, well, you've been talking about your lack of resources. So assume that ChatGPT is a research assistant, a maybe an intern and, and give it a, um, a project in the same way that you would an intern. You have to inform it, you have to tell it what you want and you ask it to do something understanding that interns and chat GPT are prone to hallucination. So she went away, she came back the next day and offered me an apology and said she'd gone home. Um, and she had picked a project, which was she had two dozen loan letters to write for an upcoming uh, show. She'd gone to chat GPT, she'd given it all the information. And within a couple of hours, um, she had two dozen loan letters kind of ready to go. So a convict understood how chat GPT or certainly generative AI could actually help her with uh, productivity. So that, that's my story. And I see we have a, uh, a raised hand. All right, um, hang on just a second. Uh, Jenny Buffalo, I'm gonna go ahead and invite you to speak. And here we go. Jenny, you don't have to have your camera on if you don't want, but you're welcome to share any opinion or question that you have. And you're muted. I was going to say, if Jenny may not know, she's muted. <clears throat> oh, an oh. Okay, sorry. No, no, too late. You've got to ask a question. Oh, and make a comment. Alex, was that you? Do you have the power? <laughs> I do have the power. That's okay, Jenny. Thank you anyways. All right. We do have an anonymous question in the Q&A. Um, do you have a posted governance or policy document indicating how, when, why you use AI that is similar to a privacy policy, terms and conditions, information retention, et cetera? We don't, but we're trying to figure out what that might look like, right? And, yeah. and I think it's it's up for discussion. Jeff, do you have one? It's a great question. Uh, we don't have anything explicit on our main museum website with regards to this we have a 
secondary website, which is ai.harvardartmuseums.org, which explains our intention with the services that we're using. And it, is, it is certainly not a formal policy in that way, but it but it is um, our, our primary way of publicly acknowledging, you know, like why and what we're doing with these services. Um, yeah, love to love to hear from anyone else who is who's working on a formal policy. I know it's in a great number of discussions, especially at the university level where I'm at. Um, you know, policies around generative AI and student use are are starting to come out um, from from Harvard. I was going to say I teach at uh, Northwestern University, and there, I've seen a many many more to, to your point policies and guidelines coming out around how to manage uh, AI. I will also say, and I can put put it in the chat. I um I found this thing called Artificial Intelligence Ethics Framework for the Intelligence Community. I underscore intelligence community. So it is a government based um uh, uh sort of site, but I have to say, like it, it actually was sort of helpful to kind of read. And in uh, here, I'll put it in the chat, and and people can sort of peruse it and and um uh, and check it out. Um, but I have to say, part of it was interesting, right? So it says one of its comments are AI can enhance the intelligence mission, but but like other new tools, we must understand how to use this rapidly evolving technology in a way that aligns with our principles to prevent unethical outcomes. Cultural Heritage Museum, right? Cultural Heritage World, right? You immediately can go like, okay, got it. it at least at the moment, it kind of frames it in a, so it's, it might be a useful resource for people to kind of like veer off and, and sort of think adjacently to what's going on. All right, we have Valerie Kincaid in the Q&A now. I'm gonna invite her to talk. Whenever you're ready, Valerie. Morning, Alex, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, how about you? It's been a while. Good, thanks, yeah. So um, yeah, just, you know, I have an interest from the, the curatorial and collections management side. So I'm always looking at, you know, what is AI doing and how is it um, interacting with that space in the museum? Um, so when I read the New York Times article about um, the Nasher at Duke and, and their AI generated exhibit, you know, I think that was great. And I, and I don't think it was actually that um, surprising what, what happened, you know, in terms of the objects that it selected and the, the choices that it made and everything. Because of course, AI, the whole thing about it is learning, right? So it's obviously going to learn the more often we do this with it, the more often we give it the same task over and over again. And such. I think that the the alarming part to me about that um, was the reaction, uh, the administrative re reaction that was, um, you know, looking back at the objects that it chose, and then the staff looking at the CMS records. And what the staff's reaction was, well, maybe we ought to be changing the way we describe the objects. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, the AI is now training us. <laughs> right. We're not training it. <laughs> so I thought that was a really interesting reaction. And I can totally see that, especially from the non-interpretive staff viewpoint, that, oh, well, if it got it wrong, it's our fault. <laughs> So those were the, the kind of things that, that have been like tickling my brain and in, in some of the reactions to what's going on with AI and, and, and the, this space. That's great. Thank you, Valerie. I mean, I think the conversation that we're having right now is, is like, well, where do we insert it? So, you know, in one respect, it's kind of back end in the system. You're using AI and Jeff, you talked about generating descriptive um, interpretive text. So you know, there's there's one option to actually permanize, that's not even a word, make it permanent, you know, so you go into your collections management system, and you populate it with generated text, and then somebody goes through and, and reviews it. Or you, you assume that it's just this temporary, kind of just in time connection between the audience and, and the work of art, and it's just doing some in the moment translation that is grabbing your attention around a collection object, for example, and then leading you to the more authoritative, you know, approved, reviewed um, copy. And so we're having that conversation because then you don't get, um, you to some extent bypass that conversation, that internal conversation of, you know, hand wringing and, tears before bedtime about, well, you know, if, are we going to commit this to permanency? Okay. I'm going to just jump into, and, uh, you know, for those of us who have, who've spent uh, uh, quite a number of years with their, with their 
hands deep in collections and data, I, I find that it's very easy to get lost in the notion that the things us, the folks at our museums put in their CMS is, is hard fact. When in fact, it, it is, it is, tends to be not. And it's based, the data we put in tends to be based on our, you know, worldview and experience of, at that time. In the best cases, if we're cataloging living artists, we can get direct input from them. But um, even living artists change their opinion about what they want to call a painting or why it was made or some other aspect of it. And uh, we can't lose sight that what we put in the CMS is indeed uh, fungible in, in, in many aspects. And AI can come along and feed in you know new perspectives happily alongside our our historian and curatorial uh, perspectives to give us a more nuanced and textured view of artwork that is specific to a context you know a point in time and that's going to change and our systems certainly need to evolve to to accept that uh, and and deal with it I think you know that there's this is a classic example of you know we we overestimate technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term and i think you know there's an expectation that this thing suddenly you know it suddenly appeared on on the, in the general kind of consciousness but it is a you know nobody claimed that it, that it was this kind of world authority and i remember when you know when wikipedia started coming out there was this people were horrified right that people that anybody could just add facts to a website and then it was taken as um the authority you know now we have a different perspective on on wikipedia and we do use it well a lot of people use it as an initial entry point to research and information but the 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 trust and the value of wikipedia is at a much higher level than it was when it initiated and i think that, that it's the same thing with you know chat gpt or whatever it is but i think it's you know as right now we talk about kind of generative ai as a product right it's a thing you go to a website chat gpt and then you do this thing as opposed to what's likely to happen very in the short to medium term is it it, it will be a service behind things i mean i'm starting to use chat gpt in google docs and sheets and stuff i don't i don't interact directly with chat gpt right now and I think increasingly you'll see that. Um, Bill Gates, no, I think it was much, um, it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, John, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Valerie, for bringing up that that um, subject. That was good, a good thing for us to cover today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and invite John to speak now. Hey, John, it's been a while. Hi there. John. Good to see you all. Can you hear me? Yes, yes indeed. Yes, can. Great. Yeah, great conversation. So thank, uh, thank you so much for initiating this. So I, I'm not expecting you know, a solid answer to this question. It's more kind of a philosophical issue here. Um, you know, we've, for years, we've been operating with the aspiration that there's somewhere out there lurking a singular reality that we can someday all share, right? right. And, uh, and we've also been talking about authority and who really has the best grasp on that. And, you know, we're probably all working in a space where uh, there are multiple, multiple perspectives and we're wrestling with these different perspectives coming together. So. How do you see the potential for AI as it maybe improves itself that it can help us move into recognizing these different perspectives rather than trying to drive towards a single single answer? You know, Jack, you had that little that little cartoon, you know, the bird's eye view and the worm's eye view, you know. So I don't know, is this gonna help or hurt, you know, not endeavor yes that is the question <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean i i, I mean again i think conversations i think i, th I mean you know, Gwen, i sort of pull together a number of things that jeff's has brought up and nick's brought up and that you just brought up i think that it's about sort of owning the multiple there's we know there's multiple perspectives we know we know that and we know and we and we should convey con, continue to convince ourselves along with our colleagues that it's a tool that needs to be used 
And I think the other, you know, and, and John, part of the thing I would also say, which again, I think I would connect to, to what uh, Nick and Jeff were talking earlier is that, right, it's a tool. Okay, so what's the tool using? And right, and, and again, Jeff, you talked about, like, right? it's data, right? So it's hard data and it's soft data, right? And, and, and we could go down that rabbit hole and maybe we should go down that rabbit hole. But the other piece to that is then, just take that comment really selfishly for a moment, like as a cultural heritage expert, and, and as an organization, how is it be? How is that data being collected? How is it being retrieved? How are we managing? It? How are we transforming it? How are we using it? Right? All those questions, actually, to say sort of weirdly plainly, aren't AI related? I mean, yes, AI impact. Like we're using that data, but we need to have. There's also a conversation here on how we need to manage that data in a really smart, meaningful way, so that that multi those multiple perspectives and 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 different avenues and and, and different ways in which we're going to uh, engage with it, we we gain confidence and better understanding, knowing that we as a community are providing that data in a in a in a in an ethical, smart, constructive way. All right, thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. We have Brian Hewitt. I'm going to invite you to talk about um, your question in the Q&A. Unless, Brian, you prefer that we just answer your question. Um, we can certainly do that. We can make it up. Uh, so I'll yeah. read it. What, what are your thoughts of dealing with hallucinations, if we're using AI tools, how do we have confidence that what is generated is reliable without a lot of working, a work verifying details? I mean, this is the crux of the problem, right? It, it's, and I think Matt is, is uh, uh, says it clearly. It's like, it's not really the software per se, it's what the information is that it's working on. And if that, you know, so, you know, let's talk about bias, right? So if the, if the information it's getting is biased, it doesn't know whether it's biased or not. And I think that was the, the Jack's first point. All right, you know, it, it's kind of a, you know, trust but verify. Um, who was that? Was that, was that, was that Reagan? Trust but verify. Um, and I think that's the case here, right? It's an emerging technology. It is, its view of the world is um, kind of two or three years old. Um, you know, much has happened in, in the world, even in those um, couple of years that, you know, the, the world is, is different. I know at some point it, it, it kind of comes online, you know, a bit like Skynet, you know, when it will understand the world in a much more contempt with a much more contemporary lens. But I think it's still, there is an issue of bias that is inherently built in it, but that's, that's the internet, right? That's, that's where it's getting, the majority of its of its content so it, it's up to us to be judicious about when it does hallucinate you know how how bad is its hallucination how how biased is its hallucination and, and what do we do with it i mean I, th I think certainly we use it in a way that is um you know when we're not asking it to interpret things we're, we're kind of asking it when we use it to to give us a grounding, you know, rather than starting off with a blank document, it's like, well, what is the outline for a something that, you know, solves this problem? So we don't actually just let it write, you know, something and then we use it. I think this also, this also touches on kind of, uh, uh, there's, yeah, when, when, when I think about hallucinations, you know, it's, it, like quickly come back to like what context are you using this stuff and is it okay for can you accept hallucinations in the scenarios in which you're using it um and that dovetails with the thought like well folks going into using um all kinds of ai stuff um you kind of need to go with it in your into it with your eyes wide open but at the same time there's there's a really great impulse to just like tinker with the stuff because it seems so cool and like oh it just can answer my questions and and tell me stuff and synthesize information um so like how do you how do you reconcile the need to just 
be pretty informed before jumping into in, into using some of these things in, in certain scenarios and and wanting to just kind of fish around and explore and there's no there's no quick or easy answer there other than um you know be mindful of what what situations you're you're using these tools in and 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 you know come up with some 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 degree of comfort with 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 error if it if it fits your for fits your use you know what you're what you're doing at at the moment with it um yeah we've had some wonderful hallucinations written about objects in our collection or objects that actually don't exist in the real world but you know ai's think are in our collection and and it, it's poetic but yeah it's 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 wrong but maybe the thing exists in some other alternate universe you know if you believe in the multi verse theory this ai is tapping into so again, like and here I go on my own hallucination, uh, riffing on AIs. So uh, <laughs> good question, <laughs> rambling answer. No, I, I put it just as a thought, argumentum ad populum, which is if everybody believes something to be true, it must be true. You know, and that's kind of where we are with, with Wikipedia, right? It's like, I don't know, it's in the top 10 websites, you know, first source for information. Um, so if it's in wikipedia it must be true you know the danger is that we we don't take its a view and opinion and results you know like i said trust but verify thank you brian uh sorry that you're having audio issues uh we have carrie kennedy who i'm going to invite has a couple questions concerning pub the public art perspective Go ahead, Carrie, whenever you're ready. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to come to this workshop because as a professional who is on the end of seeing AI and seeing it come into our workspaces, um, as opposed to being a programmer or a creator of it, we're trying to play catch up and I work for a government agency. And so my public art perspective comes in a couple of ways when, uh, we commission artworks uh, through grant a granting agency to different organizations. We're starting to see artists use virtual technology more and more, not so much to create work, but to interpret their work. But of course, both of those things are eventually going to get, I guess, folded in together. And this will apply to both of my questions about tools and policies so that when we have panels, how do we explain not so much the, the interpretive part of public art, but if artists decide to decide to start creating um, work with AI and how that will create maybe an imbalance with artists who are working in real time and how that will be worked out. And some of the policies we have prohibit some things and, and it could go that way, but we don't want to limit artists. And we want our art collections to continue to grow. So again, we, we're going to need tools for integrating policies and, and, and managing that. But then when you look at it from a cultural heritage perspective, my concern are biases. So of course, in our public art collection, we have, say, uh, a, a monument or a statue of African-American Union soldiers. And so I get very nervous because how is that going to pop up when people search? If people want to kind of hack in and do kind of like a, a misinformation of that, again, who's who who's creating the policies or I guess the watch uh, dog organizations that mm -hmm. would help us with that or help us manage that? How would we figure out a way to kind of get that back in the algorithm and up? more truthful way. And again, it's going back to policies and tools. And then the underlying piece of this is we already know that there are biases in AI. The people who have designed it are not necessarily the people who either think about people of color and women yeah. um, as artists or as uh, monuments to their um, work. And so where does that start? And I, I hate it because I already see, okay, so African-Americans, people of color are going to have to create their own and kind of push up into this that has already been going on, are the people who are doing the programming at the forefront of this thinking about that? And 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 even this panel is a little troubling because I don't see anybody that would bring that up as you're working on policies and things like that. So hopefully that, I'll let it go. 
No, no, your point is well taken. And, you know, we don't come up with these things uh, on our own. You know, we work with institutions and, and rely on their needs and, and requirements in, in helping them. We just, you know, kind of help steer that, um, that strategy to create it. So, you know, we, I mean, we can make recommendations, um, but really it's up to, and, and we'd be more than happy to share that, we, you know, when we do come up with policies, uh, assuming that the institution is is um, uh, willing to, to do that. Um, but I think, you know, that that's the big problem of, of all of this, right, is, is this inherent bias in it. You know, it's like a very simple example, but when... Um, uh, audio, audio um, uh, it, like things like Siri and, and Cortina, when those things first came out, as an Englishman who now has a slightly mid-Atlantic twang now, I, these they, they couldn't understand what I was saying. Right? I had to put on an American accent for it to understand what I was saying. And it was, you know, and, and you know, the deeper the voice and the more American the accent, the more the more accurate the, the translation and I think that's uh, or more accurate the understanding and I think you know that's where we are with this I think the you know when I think about well what what do policies look like you know what what are the precedents out there well you know things like the um, FCC and you know broadcasting policies around what you can and can't uh, say and you know those may be some um, basis for generating um, policies and I just you know as, as I think about what well, how you know who owns the like you said who, who owns the policies you know how and then how do we police them um it, it really is you know this this thing has come out of the gate I mean you're already seeing all these lawsuits coming up from um you know authors there was I think like two 200 authors and some really big names who you know are rightly claiming that their IP has been stolen you know generative art you know a whole bunch of artists uh bringing class action lawsuits saying that um the the response you know generative art that is coming out is clearly stolen from their ip and so it, it is a really big problem all right Thank you, Carrie. Really appreciate you coming on and, and bringing up that. Um, that is really important to this discussion. I'm going to go ahead and now invite Matt Morgan to join. And um, here we go. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, yeah. Matt. Yes. Hi. So, I, I mean, I think a lot of people have seen the questions I wrote. Really, I'm just asking is, how is this different from you know, since 1996, we've had so many online supposed threats to authority that really ended up not that big being a big deal because we continued to do good research and cite our sources like we always did. Clearly, there's some kind of difference here because we don't know what the ultimate source is. But as long as we maintain our authority and we treat the AI as tools, like what substantially is changing here? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, you, one, of the, one thought that st stuck in my head that kind of goes back to, to the pre some of the previous points is uh, like what I, th what I think you're touching on is, is, this, is this notion that I've been trying to push in our own cataloging, which is, which is ensuring we Ensuring we adhere to a, a you know, strict policy on data provenance at, at the at the datum level, and really acknowledge you know where things are generated from, and uh, whether it's human versus whether it's algorithm, whether it's something you want to call AI, whether it's you know some other combination of factors, but but really adapting our practices and and the, and the systems we use to manage any of the of the knowledge that we we, we met, manage to really try to wrap as much context and state of mind around it as possible and in turn make that as plainly publicly available for folks to use to understand you know 
why this thing they're reading that we say about an artwork or, or whatever it might be is is being said like it came from this this thing and again going back to ai's being black boxes you know we we can it do just, our best it, yep go ahead it, it feels to me like we actually have really strong practices when it comes to that kind of thing you know blogging was a little bit scary at first we thought all these people are biased all these people you know do or do not know what they're talking about um and anybody can be an authority was like a you know a thing uh wikipedia similar the you know there there was a competitor to wikipedia at first and their shtick was that they hired uh professionals in the fields to edit the articles and it didn't work because the professionals wanted to edit the articles on wikipedia wikipedia became the place that professionals wrote their wiki descriptions of everything um so i it, this i don't want to be all sunshiny about ai i mean i think it's potentially we're all going to be you know <laughs> out of jobs and and sad and depressed um but when it comes to museum issues, authority issues, I actually feel like we're in good shape to, this is something we have a practice of. I mean, yeah, maybe but, it's worth challenging that, you know. But I think the danger is we're not in control of it, right? As, as far as, and, and I'd love to be corrected, as far as I can see, the only way that we could unbias it mm. is a combination of Something, I mean, uh, Valerie put it, made a good point um, about uh, an intern reviewing past perfect uh, descriptions and it tried to correct some of the decolonized language. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and it's doing it's doing that because it doesn't, you know, it has it doesn't have enough data behind it, you know, that is available on the Internet to, you know, balance the argument and, and, and train it. You know, it's not it's it's. As I understand it, the way chat GPT or, or the, these are called large language models, right? And the way they work is purely on statistical analysis of data yeah, yeah. and text that they've got, right? So it's predicting it's only, the next most likely word. Right. Basically. Predicting the next most likely word, right? And so the only way to address that, unless some, you know, something is changed in in the coding, is, is to populate it with the data that need, is needed to unbias it. Well, yeah, or, or to watch it and recognize that it made mistakes. You know, if we, I feel like- Right, if, but, but, but we can, but we, we understand, you know, the problem is some of us understand that that's a problem, that it's not, that it's not using decolonized language and that it should. The, the challenge is a lot of the population are just going to take it on True. face value. And that that's the, the problem, you know, it's all it's doing is creating an echo chamber again, as we know, in like social media and, you, you know, partisan news, it, it's creating an echo chamber for people to confirm what they already think to be true. And, and the only way I think the only way to do it is, you know, how do we prime it, you know, it would be interesting to see when these engines these large language models become more contemporary and they're getting information certainly from the last two or three years what effect that has on these kinds of things so valerie's example for example mm -hmm. did, did francis have a um i did see that but she put it back down oh, um francis if you want to uh be invited to speak just put your hand back up again uh thank you so much for that matt yeah that was great matt Oh, you were looking for the thumbs up. Um, all right. I, I think we have time for one more. I'm going to go ahead and invite Sharon Clapp to talk. Sharon, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Or we can go ahead and read your question out loud. Uh, do you have concerns? Um, are, are you having concerns about the intellectual property of nonprofit cultural heritage organizations being harvested and exploited by for-profit organizations? I mean, it's, it's kind of like 
artists, right? So uh, artists' rights and reproduction. So if you're a music artist, you know, the, if, if you're a venue that plays music, you know, you have to pay a license fee for that, which gets distributed to, to the artists. I mean, I, I don't know what the option, you know, th this is a, a complicated subject. And, and I know it's a certainly from a policy, a, a federal policy standpoint and, and a kind of a, a global usage of this, you know, it's this always happens, right? Technology springs out in, into the consciousness and and the policymakers have to catch up, right? And so they, you know, you, you never get the policy first. You know, it's like, oh, AI is going to become a thing, so we need to establish the policies first. You know, it, it always happens the wrong way around. And so all of us are playing catch up to, to figure this out. So, you know, maybe there is some opportunity to, you know, for, I don't know, compensation for people who have clearly had their IP stolen. Um, and if you've ever, you know, if you've ever questioned ChatGPT on something and asked it to um, cite its sources, like it, it won't tell you. Uh, it just says, well, I'm an AI engine. That makes no sense, you know? And and it's because it is doing this statistical thing. So it would be hugely problematic for it to figure out where it got its citation from because it would probably be a, you know, percentage Also, is, I mean, this question makes me think, uh, you know, again, I'm coming from a specific art museum perspective, uh, you know, even more specifically university art, art perspective. Uh, and I, and I think about, you know, peer institutions that have facets of the collection out there under like creative Commons zero, like the most generous, generous license, you know, possible and how, how those institutions are thinking about that in relation to what these mega commercial AI harvesting companies are doing. I don't have any grand thoughts or answers on that. And I, I would love to hear from any of the organizations that are um, that have that kind of licensing scheme. And if they feel like this this changes anything for them. Um, of course, yes, in you know, living artists versus long dead artists, old art uh Adds a adds a whole other uh, complicated dimension to it as well. Any final thoughts? Since we are we have a few minutes left, I, I guess the I, I'd ask you know attendees. You know we're happy to host, and and I think we need to host another one of these. And it's like, what should the subject be? I think this was just we're we're raising the topic. You know what is of most concern to the community that you know we should continue the discussion on this is a question that we have in our survey too so if Perfect. there are if Please there are the survey. AI topics that you would like us to cover in our webinar series, please complete the survey. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat again. Unfortunately we are out of time but thank you everyone is, for attending. What, one point is is there a place if people want to be on the panel? That would be great. I can add that question in. That's a good Thanks. point. Because I was going to say, if you would like to participate in our webinar series, please reach out. I'm going to add that question to our survey. Survey. Thank you, Nick. Um, again, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone who's participated in the discussion today um, and joining us for another webinar. Um, if you are interested in seeing any of our other webinars, uh, they are on our YouTube channel. Please check them out. Um, if you want to stay up to date on what BPOC is doing in our webinar series, uh, check out our website, follow us on social media. Um, again, don't forget to take some time to complete the survey if you haven't done so already. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again. Thanks, take everyone. Care. Take care. Bye. -bye. Take care.